all, thank you everybody for going through the uh, processing of the briefings and the peer critiques and the feedback on the peer critiques. Things went fairly well so far. Uh, or this time around, they went better than last time, let's say. Is the, are you, is the mic on? No, I'm just loud. Okay, so um, we're still waiting for, I think, three or four students in the class to give their responses to the peer critiques, and then we'll release uh, the um, briefing grading, which uh, is useful and important, uh, as well as, of course, the feedback grade. Oh, we'll release all the grades. You'll see all those. Uh, we're just trying to uh, put it all out there at once. Uh, we have, I believe, actually, only four more classes left in this uh, course. Uh, we've got the last class we're going to be doing is on the 8th of April. Uh, so just as a, uh, uh, not necessarily a heads up, but uh, two things. One is that uh, you're going to have to finish Golan by the end of the class, uh, so I recommend that you do that. I'm going to, I've been a little bit distracted because I've um, been doing things and my, my book is almost done, uh, so I'll uh, catch up on some things this weekend and get sorted out as far as the Golan material is concerned and make sure that gets integrated into the last three lectures. And um, I also invite you, uh, if you are, uh, if you enrolled in this class and you were hoping to hear something about a resource or something about the environment and we haven't yet covered it, send me an email and say, I really want to talk about this before the end of class. That's fine by me. Uh, as you know, I could talk about pretty much any dimension of these things and way too much uh, I can talk about those things. But it would be good if you uh, come out of this class getting what you want, uh, assuming that you had some desire when you came in. So. Um, what else? Finish the Dolan, do that. Uh, the paper, oh, by the way, so I mentioned on when I sent out the video uh, assignment for the, all those TED Talks, uh, which are higher quality talks than, your, than uh, you get here, uh, I said, and read the paper, my paper, the one that I had actually mentioned casually uh, earlier in the class. Um, and that's come up several times in terms of the material, so now I'm making it required reading, as in it might be on the final. Uh, the link is in that email. It's, a, it's an SSRN link. And it's called Economy, Economist of Ecology and Apology. The reason I assign that now is because there's a discussion of the problem of economists who use uh, macro statistics uh, such as GDP, uh, and that becomes a policy instrument, uh, which means that politicians pursue GDP, ne not necessarily thinking about the uh, uh, externalities of GDP, right? We've talked about that as well as the uh, a problem of economic models uh, and other types of uh, assumptions that are used in economics all the time, more or less being inaccurate as far as reality is concerned. So I want you to appreciate those ideas given that you're economists so that you at least uh, know uh, some of the uh, practices in economics that are not very um, useful. They're actually, I, the, the GDP problem is actually so significant, I would, I would say it's, it's um, it might be responsible for you know 10% or or so. The measurement of GDP might be responsible for 10% or so of, um, of the problems we're having with sustainability in the world. You know, 80% might be consumption. The idea that we need to have big, bigger houses than the guy next to us. 10% literally is the way that we measure stuff uh, because it's so badly done with GDP. So you'll uh, get to uh, that when you read the paper, and I'll discuss it in class as well. Uh, I want to um, get to a little bit more commentary on and, and discussion of uh, cap and trade, which uh, we were talking about last time, last Thursday. Uh, but I also want to go over some of the results of homework, uh, homework three, uh, so that I put that in context, the work that you guys did looking up the water tariffs. Number one, that was uh, very good. Most of you uh, did fine on that. I wasn't, as I mentioned, I wasn't going to uh, very, be very harsh on um, your interpretation of supply and demand and so on. I read some of the comments uh, and some people, the, the ones that I kind of scattered through, uh, I was like looking at all of them and, and every once in a while someone would say something which just was not correct. So that would mean losing a point, but most of you got full credit on that assignment. It doesn't necessarily mean that you had a full statement of the connections between supply and demand. So I want to talk about that right now so you see how that works uh, from the water sector uh, side of things. And uh, then we'll go back to cap and trade and uh, go over some of the, the problems uh, that it has and the, or the way it's supposed to work and compare it to carbon taxes, of course. Are there any open, any questions or, or uh, open areas of, 
of confusion or anything like that? Logistical? Anything else? I'll do, oh, by the way, evaluation will be next Tuesday. So usually the Tuesday class, I've noticed the waves coming and going. The Tuesday class tends to have more people, so we'll have more evaluations, and that'll be handy. So um, the homework. Uh, I emailed you the blog post where I had done a little bit of statistical analysis. There were 80 uh, submissions. Uh, there, were, uh, uh, there were several duplications, as some of you found out, because I was, asking, I was actually asking you guys to cross-check each other. Uh, and when I eliminated the duplication and we got down to 53 cities or, or tariff regimes for 53 cities, we started with per capita consumption of water. So we knew uh, we were fine. We, we knew what per capita consumption of water was, and in, in the U.S. is gallons. So we had uh, gallons per capita per day, and this is basically um, uh, we can call this demand. Right, and it's demand from an uh, it's an average demand. So, whatever I'll put a hat on it. So the the average demand in a particular place, I was the gallons per capita per day. You were all taken it from the same list. That list was was uh, the data on that list was flawed, by the way, uh, not intentionally. But it's very difficult to measure the quantity of water consumed per day. Let me tell you why. If you have uh, a utility, and it, this is how much water is used. 100% uh, is, is used, you have to decide uh, what are you talking about, right? And there's uh, one definition of, of used is going to be, um, let's call it diverted. So that's the water that's taken out of the environment, whether it's out of a, 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 a groundwater source or out of a surface source, right? So that could be the definition of water that is used, as in it's diverted, and then 100% of that is consumed. And then that's your numerator, because you're looking at gallons. So you're going to have this big thing called diversion divided by population. And then you're going to get gallons per capita per day. There's problems, of course, with population, but that's not such a big deal. The, it's, it's more or less in the, in the ballpark. But with the water, you can say, OK, we'll divide it by diversion. But maybe uh, some of the, so say this is all the diverted water. What happens with leaks? Is that counted in consumption? Now, on the one hand, from an environmental perspective, it definitely counts. But from the perspective of people who are using water, it doesn't count because they didn't use that water. It leaked out of the system. Uh, another question is, uh, what's, the di what's the difference between, uh, let's say, industry and households, right? If you have. Uh, water used by a uh, Subway sandwich shop, right? Or used at an office, or used in a factory. That water is consumed, but there's no um, people using it for their personal uses. Because most of these discussions are about how much water do people use at home. On the other hand, you can't exactly say that a city that has industry is not using any water, because they're clearly using water. And if they're using less water, that's lo a lower uh, stress on the environment. So it's actually a little bit tricky to decide whether or not you want to include industrial use in these cal calculations of total consumption. So you have to decide, am I going to include, this is called um, M&I, which is municipal and industrial. That's the category, right? So usually in the business, you say municipal industrial consumption, all of it counts. Because if you don't have any industry, then people aren't going to live there anyway or some long, logical discussion. And, uh, and then you divide that through by the population. But why wouldn't leaks count, right? If you, if you leak half your water out, in some places in the developing world, 70% of the water leaks out of the system. Well, it's clearly having an impact, and it's being used in a way, because uh, if, there, if the water, uh, it, the leakage is occurring because of the delivery of water. So there's a, there's a different question there. So all I'm trying to tell you here is that when someone says, water consumption is X, you want to say, are you including leakage? Are you including industrial? That's the, that's the big thing I want you to talk about. But then on the other hand, uh, and, and then there's a third thing, which is not included in either, any of the statistics you saw. Um, gallons per capita per day is a direct measure. What's a, a direct measure of water consumption? I wash my hands. I take a shower. I uh, uh, prepare food at the sink. or 
uh, I go to the uh, office and I uh, use water at the office because uh, I'm making whatever, sandwiches for people. Those are all, in a sense, direct measures of consumption in these categories, right? But how else do we use water? In terms of, if I died today, my direct water consumption would fall, but what other water consumption would fall? What, in, what is an indirect measure of water consumption? What can you think of that, uh, in terms of your impact on water? And yes, you with the glasses. No, yeah, you. Both of you, go ahead. How do you indirectly consume water? No, that's good though. Rainfall is falling, that's the supply side in a way. Unless you, I don't know, how do you consume rainfall? You dance in it, right? But then it, fa it goes past you. What's another uh, indirect possibility? Sorry? You don't know? Okay, we can go with that. The guy next to you. What's an indirect consumption of water? If you what? Sport? How is that in terms of sport? In terms of like the, the grass that you, nor the football, the water in the football, what is it? Water in the ice rink, that's good. Okay, so the ice rink is that, you were gonna say hockey, right? Because you're in Canada. Sport, now, how would sport consumption go? You go to the rink and there's water that you're skating on. So you're clearly, in a sense, using water. That's an activity, right? What's another way? Go ahead. You drink more water. Okay, so direct, the temperature will make you hot and you want to consume more water, but that's still direct. That's good, though. Water and power. So the water that's used, this is BC Hydro, probably, right? Cheapest energy in the world. So the water that's being used, and some people, they will say it's consumed, difficult definition, right? But used in terms of generating energy. Very significant source of uh, indirect use is energy. What's another indirect use? Is it the water that's in the coffee that you're consuming? And keep, what about the coffee in the coffee? Coffee beans. Do you need water to make coffee beans? You think so, I think so, yeah? Right, do you need water to grow rice? Do you need water to grow wheat, right? Do you need water to grow oranges that are full of juice, right? The, very, the vegetarians always like pointing out that a kilo of beef requires 15,000 liters of water to be produced. It's not because the cow drinks 15,000 liters of water. It's not because the farmer's injecting water into the beef. It's because the, the cow, before it becomes a beef, is eating grass, right? And in, in North America, eating grain. And there is a lot of water that it requires to get that production, right? Those indirect sources of consumption are called, often called virtual water, right? So they'll say, people will say, there's virtual water embedded in our food. And uh, this is significant if you're a farmer, because of course you need water, and it's significant if you're a country that's importing or exporting food, because uh, in some ways you're importing or exporting water with that food, right? Water is embedded in the food, or water is embedded in your, in your iPhone, right? Water's embedded in our clothes. Cotton, even polyester, which is made out of oil, oil uses water, right? And the, we know this for sure over in the, in the uh, oil sands, they use water to produce oil. So water is actually is, a, is an input in many different parts of the production system, and when we consume, we're indirectly consuming water. It's exactly the same, by the way, for carbon and energy or anything else. So it's, it's, I'm not saying water is special, on the other hand, Water is, uh, 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 when, we're, when, we're, when we're talking about water and water policy, we definitely need to take this into account. The reason generally is uh, that water is a lot less, a lot less uh, well managed, it's, it's a lot less well managed. It's worse managed than energy. Water in a sense is cheap, right? Canada is now confronting this idea that maybe uh, 
free water and cheap water, endless water is not going to be a good policy regime, okay, in terms of uh, pollution and so on. So um, I'll say one more thing about, about di indirect consumption. If you have a country uh, like, say, uh, Canada that has a lot of water and you're growing a lot of canola or you're growing other big commodity crops and then you're exporting those crops or you're growing a lot of oil, basically, and you're exporting that oil, in a sense, you're using your water to do that. And you want to make sure that you're doing that economically. In some ways, that means uh, you, you want to make sure that the consumption of water is agreeable as far as people are concerned. Is this a good idea to have this free water? Is it causing environmental damage? Is there pollution as a result of using this water in terms of uh, the dam is polluting the river uh, by, uh, by uh, interrupting its flow, uh, or the uh, power station is polluting the river by heating it up, or the uh, oil sands process is polluting the river by uh, putting petroleum into the river, which most fish don't like to eat. If you look at China, the problem is extremely uh, relevant now, right? Northern China has got a lot of people, uh, some farmers, not a lot of water, a huge amount of stress. If they are growing uh, foods or whatever in Northern China and exporting it somewhere else, they're exporting their water. They actually should be importing water, shouldn't they? Southern China might be, have too much water. This is a very huge generalization because China's a big place. But Southern China might have too much water. Mei Ling is doing this project on the, the south-north water transfer in my other class. And the idea is like, oh, we don't have enough water in the north. Let's move some water from the south to the north where we can consume it. Well, that's going to have some impacts, non-trivial impacts, in terms of the availability of water in the south at a minimum. Right? There's less water around. So the water that's embedded in food is the place to start, but the process of, of ensuring that, that water is not wasted or the water's not polluted or whatever, that is the policy area that's of interest if you want sustainability, if you want to have, uh, to use that resource as, uh, water as a resource to produce things, but you also don't want to create pollution that makes everybody upset, right? Because if you can't drink the water, then it's not very handy, right? Or if you can't use it for, even for growing crops, it's not very handy. The water's so polluted that fish can't live in it, that's also not very handy. Right? That's what happens in the, at the end of the Mississippi River. The, there's so much pollution in the water that there's a, a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, and the shrimp are dead, the fish are dead, everything's dead. Um, and it's not good for the fishermen, but it's also not good for people who want to eat fish. And that's relevant when we talk about food supply. So water ends up showing up everywhere, which is why I have this really fun job. Back to cities. So I asked you to look up the temperature to look up the precipitation. Precipitation is a, force, is a source of supply or demand? Supply. Temperature and heating degree days, I'll get to that in a second. Temperature is a source of supply or demand. If it's hotter, is it more demand for water or more supply of water? Demand, right? There's two kinds of demand. Number one, the ground is hot, right? There's more evaporation. Number two, oh God, I'm hot, I'm gonna have some water, right? Or you turn on the air conditioner, which uses water as well. So temperature is going to, or, or, or way more important in California, you're going to water your lawn, right? Remember that in California, over half the water, well, in Southern California, over half the water is used outside to keep lawns green, right? This is, what, this is the desert, but they, they water the desert and make it green, and then they drive by, right? Because no one actually walks on the lawns. That's not allowed. Sport. There's no, like, there's no sport. They have TV. That's all they do. I'm slagging for the California. Okay, so if the temperature goes up, the demand should go up. If the precipitation goes up, the supply should go up. Heating degree days is actually the inverse of what you should be talking about. Heating degree days means how much heat you need to stay warm, right? And places in Northern California had a higher number of heating degree days because it's colder there in general. Southern California, San Diego, Santa Barbara, LA, there were fewer heating degree days. So it's just another measurement of temperature, but it's Instead of looking at the average, whatever that was, uh, 16 degrees or so, the heating degree days would give you kind of a, a different way of measuring that. So what you should have been thinking in terms of supply and demand is, uh, I've got supply, and uh, if it rains, I've got more supply, right? Uh, and uh, if I've got demand and it gets, this is rain, if I've got demand, then uh, if it's hotter, I've got more demand. Uh, hot. 
My, my writing's terrible, so you can write better than me. But also, another part of rain is that if it rains, you don't need to water the lawn, right? So demand might, its supply goes up, but demand also might shift in if it rains. So just another thing to keep in mind. Hand, where's the hand? Yes. If it rain, what shifts out? The supply curve should shift. Oh, what did I do? Sorry, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. In fact, the arrow says exactly what you just said. Good, good correction, yes. Everything is, oh, you got more water at all temperatures. The supply is shifting out. Great. So that's the mess. All this stuff has nothing to do with price, right? What I asked you to do is look up the prices. So I wanted you to talk about demand shifters, supply shifters, but we also were looking at the demand sliders, right? How does demand slide up and down, or how do we slide up and down the demand curve in terms of price? And the relationship that I talked about in the blog is that, in that blog post, is that when the price goes up, then quantity demanded goes down, right? Law of demand still holds, right? Even with 50 data points with very, very aggregated data that's not really that good. Some guy got, this guy who commented on the post, Wayne, is a funny guy. Wayne always shows up on my blog and says things which are like, I'm going to talk about what you're talking about. Actually not. I'm going to talk about something else that I want to talk about. So anyway, he left this comment about stuff he wanted to talk about. Um, but he, he did make the point that, um, uh, what did he, what point did he make? He, he made some irrelevant point, actually. I, I can't remember what it was he was saying, but it was, uh, oh, he said, your R squared was only 0.23, right? R squared is the goodness of fit. How much of your data explains the uh, question uh, uh, that you're looking at? How much of your data on temperature and pricing and uh, uh, what else did I have in there? Uh, the fixed cost explains the per capita consumption. He says, well, you're only explaining 23%. The other 77% is... And then he went and he talked about something that didn't matter. The thing is, is that I, what I replied to him is that we don't have, this is very poor data we were working with. We had 50 data points that were aggregated at city levels. We're not controlling for income. Income is a huge determinant of demand. We're not controlling for land size, right? If you're watering your lawn or not. Uh, we're not controlling for the, the other, other kinds of supply questions, right? Uh, and, it, and because the, and here's the important thing. The price of water almost everywhere in the world is not about supply and demand of water as a resource. It's about the infrastructure cost. So if you have essentially, um, if, you're in the, if you're in the desert and you have a, a bucket of water and the bucket costs a dollar, the bucket costs a dollar, and all of you here want to share the bucket of water, as a water utility, I can sell the water for one dollar a bucket because I'm only charging you for the bucket, not the, the water in the bucket. And maybe there's only three buckets of water. And as far as you're concerned, that water could be selling for $100 a bucket from an economic perspective. Okay? But I'm only allowed to charge you for the bucket because that's how water pricing works in, in almost everywhere in the world. It's only cost recovery for the infrastructure. And so the price of water that you were getting from your, from your research that all those prices were based on the, 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 the average price, remember. Because some of you had, uh, you were looking up all kinds of different steps level prices and so on. But the average price was based on the cost of the system, the cost of the pipes, the treatment plant, the salary of the general manager. Almost nowhere is that price really related to water scarcity, right? There's an indirect version of that, which is that uh, if you're running short on water, you've got to go build a desalination plant and that's about, that's about water scarcity. And desalination plants are very expensive, so you have to pay for that, so the price goes up because of that kind of water scarcity. But it's a very indirect process. If I built a beautiful tower with flashing lights on it and raised the price of water to do cost recovery, then it would be exactly the same thing as a desalination plant in terms of the, of the, the impact on the price of water. It is not, it's not about scarcity, it's about cost recovery, okay? It's about 
And, and the reason I'm saying this, and you should think about it, is that in the water business, it is one of the only businesses in the entire world where that's the way the accounting is done. Any for-profit business, clothing, Starbucks, cars, oil, farming, all of those businesses, they look at the price of the resources, they look at the price of all the other inputs, they look at the profit margin, and that's how prices get set, especially with competition. Okay? When you're buying a cotton shirt, you're paying for the cotton, the farmer, the land, the, the water that's pumped on the land, the shipping, the dyeing. You're, you're paying for all those things. And that's how the, you get a price of a shirt. And there's, there's other guys who are competing with other kinds of shirts. And so the price in the marketplace is going to reflect cost plus the interaction supply and demand. In the water sector, it's going to be, because it's not a market, it's almost always a monopoly. This is the big thing. You can only buy your tap water from one company in most parts of the world. So those monopolies are only uh, charging a price that reflects cost recovery. It's the pipes, it's the pumping, it's the treatment, uh, it's the salaries, but the water itself is usually sold to you for free because the water company is getting the water for free because the government is letting them have it for free. Right? So it does go back in a way. If a water company has to buy water, which is, for example, what happens in Chile, where water uh, is privatized and water is marketed as a resource, then the water companies in Chile will be selling you water, and the price of water is going to reflect the system costs plus the, the cost of water, the scarcity. But that's very unusual, because water rights are not usually traded in that. And the reason this is a problem is because there's many, many parts of the world where water prices are too low because uh, uh, they're recovering system costs, but they're not talking about water scarcity, which is what we would talk about as economists. I've been doing water economics for 10 years, and I'm still flabbergasted, and this is a fact, and I still have to explain it over and over again to people who are in the water business that this is not a good idea. Because the headlines are always, you know, water crisis, water shortage, right? And they're like, well, how are we going to solve this crisis? In America, we know we're going to take all the water from Canada. Someone actually said on a TV show, oh, God, it was bad. Someone said, I heard this thing that someone, uh, some seven-year-old was talking about uh, on a TV show on because he was famous for some reason, and uh, the guy said, what are you going to do about climate change? That must be why the seven-year-old, he was an expert in climate change, apparently. And he says, oh, well, all we have to do is kill all the people in China, and that'll take care of China climate change. And the host was like, well, seven-year-old kid, what am I going to do about this, right? And the reason I know this story is because that TV host had to apologize on the air for basically talking, not about genocide, like, everything aside, right? Like, just like, you know, killing 1.3 billion people, ha ha, great joke, right? But um, the, the, why am I start talking about this? I got on this riff with the seven-year-old and having to apologize because um, that's not going to solve the problem. What is it else? Yeah, the, there's the local monopolies. I have to remember what the seven-year-old thing is later. I'll get to it. The local monopolies are all serving various cities, but they're all buying water out of a market, right? So the price of water shows up in, in to the utilities. Why did I start talking about the seven-year-old? That was crazy. The apology for Asia's things. It was dumb. I'll get to it later, though. So what I wanted you to do is, is to look up those prices, and we found a relationship between demand and price. That was the, the key idea. Oh, yeah. I got going on something. I totally lost my track. So if you had a, a demand curve like this, and you just look at the demand for water, and there's not enough water, basically, oh gosh, we're having a water crisis, there's not enough water, then the economics answer to this is raise the price of water. And I have been trying to say, I've been saying this as advice for 10 years, and it's extremely difficult to get people to listen to this. I can't even believe how hard it is for people to understand this point. Maybe you all get it, but in the water sector, they're like, what are you talking about? It's a human right, or... Uh, we would make a profit and that would be bad, or uh, la 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 la. And they have this, these, all these really strange explanations for why they shouldn't do something when it's a very obvious tool. 
the way to the way to handle this is you raise the price of water, and then you're doing cost recovery. Total cost equals total revenue. This is the target that the, all the water managers are hitting. And then if you raise the price, you're going to have total revenue greater than total cost. Long story short, you're going to have total revenue greater than total cost. Guess what? You give some money back to customers. Who's going to be upset about that? But what you do is you raise the price to choke down demand, and then you get rid of the shortage. That's the goal. You get rid of the shortage. You have the excess money. Great. Now you can give money back to people. Okay? So that's, that's the discussion that uh, is occurring over and over and over again on my blog on water policy. Um, and what you guys did is you contributed more data to this discussion of, guess what? You raise the price, people use less water. That's the, the big scientific breakthrough of what you did. So thanks very much for contributing to that. Um, I'll stop talking about water now, and, uh, and who knows if I'll ever remember what happened with that uh, seven-year-old story. Any questions on this? Yes. Yeah. Bottled water. Well, of course. So bottled water, unlike um, drinking water, tap water, right? Bottled water doesn't have this constraint, right? A bottled water company has this objective, maximize profits, right? Nestle or uh, uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Coca-Cola and Pepsi are the two biggest bot bottled water sellers in North America. Aquafina and the other brand are both from Coca-Cola, what? Dasani. They're both brands that are just owned by Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Guess what? They sell you sugary water with bubbles in it. They sell you non-sugary water without bubbles in it. You go to the store or in the vending machine, I see this all the time. It's like $1.25 for Pepsi, $1.25 for water. And there's a drinking fountain right next to them going, really? And you know they get most of that water from the municipal water supply. What they do is they filter it once and then they put it in a bottle. But why does bottled water cost uh, anything? You've got to take it out of the source, which is usually for free, and that can be a problem. Then you put it in a bottle in your expensive plant that you have to pay for that has like three workers. It's like highly automated. There's no people around. Then you have to ship it, which costs a lot because water is so heavy, right? A cubic meter of water is a ton, right? So, uh, and, and in, uh, say, Vancouver, the average consumption might be 250 liters a person a day. So 250 kilos of water that's being shipped across somewhere to you. If you're lucky, it's shipped by gravity. If you're unlucky, BC Hydro is using all that power to push the water up the hill to, to burn it, right? So the bottled water company, they have to put it on the truck, and then they take it to a store. The store has uh, a, a, a rack leasing price. So you have to pay for your, your next to potato chips, your bottled water, beer. You have to pay for the rent like everybody else. And so that's why the price of bottled water is not zero, right? It's a cost of any other manufactured good. Uh, but there's a huge competition. There's like all these different brands of bottled water. So the, the, they don't have market power. They don't have a monopoly. So they're allowed to profit maximize. And they're going to advertise and say, our bottled water is better than your bottled water. And you know who knows, really? They, put the, they have like bottled water for women. Have you seen that? It comes in a very nice bottle, pink. It's still water. Yeah, it has really good water. Yeah, because Vancouver, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the tap water in Vancouver is, I mean, I, bottled water, when you have access to very good drinking water, bottled water is kind of not a good bargain, I'd say, right? Uh, but some people, like my dad loves, he loves that opening the bottle in the way. <laughs> oh, fresh. He gets a little teeny bottle, so he can do it all the time. <laughs> Done, right? The one sip bottle. My dad's nuts. So um, let's go back to climate change and cap and trade. I want to wrap up this stuff because we only have 15 minutes. And we'll have more time to talk about climate change uh, in other lectures, but I want to get to some stuff that we were talking about. First of all, um, cap and trade. Where we were, we were talking about it last week. I'm just going to uh, go over the highlights and so that we can finish that off. The first thing is you have uh, you, need, you need science will give you the cap. That's how much carbon you can put out, right? Then you have politics. 
which is going to be distributing the, the permits, the government's going to say every person is going to get a permit. Or the government's going to say everybody who was using carbon before gets a permit. You guys don't get any permits. Remember that long discussion? That's all the politics. That's all the lobbying, right? There's not very much lobbying around this. There's a lobbying around that. Because if there's going to be a cap and trade, which is the big point. Now, of course, no cap and trade at all is good for businesses that don't like carbon uh, limits. But if there's going to be cap and trade, then you want to be the group that gets the permits, right? And the reason the EU cap and trade regime has collapsed, basically, by the way, is the government gave out too many permits to um, industry, <clears throat> and especially to, uh, actually, Russia and Ukraine, our favorite newsworthy countries, because um, the permits were based on 1990 emissions. 1990, uh, okay, that's our baseline. And then guess what happened in 1991? The Soviet Union collapsed, and industrial production dropped by 80%, more or less, right? So what happened is the USSR, which is Russia and Ukraine and another 14 or 13 countries came out of the USSR, they were all given permits based on 1990 pollution, which was huge. The Soviet Union was really all about pollution. If you think China is bad, forget it. This is lucky, lucky the Soviet Union shut down because it would have been terrible if they had kept going. So um, they had all these permits that were given to them based on 1990 carbon output and then uh, they had no carbon output because their industry has collapsed and it's you know, turned into various kinds of mafia uh, businesses. And so now they have all these uh, permits they want to sell to the European countries, right? And when those permits came on the market, the price collapsed. It went from about 25 euros a ton down to now around 5 euros a ton. And the ministers are trying to change the rules to, to remove supply. Big political discussion, right? Because guess what? If you don't have permits, then you have to p buy them, and that's expensive. And no, none of the energy guys want to spend any money. Then we have the economics, which is about the trade. Now, the, the simple definition of, or the simple theory of why cap and trade is good is that we put a cap on it, so we're going to get to the, to the limit we want, and we're going to have trading, which allows the low-cost uh, producers to reduce their pollution faster than the high-cost producers. So, you're going to have marginal abatement costs uh, is going to be like uh, this for one company and like this for another. The marginal abatement cost, the cost of reducing your carbon, right? You can define this up or down. It doesn't really matter. What you want to talk about is, okay, if I have a marginal, if I have a marginal abatement cost, I get to... Uh, here, let's call this whatever. Let's we'll call that a lot, and we'll call this a little. This guy's over here. So this company has a very an escalating marginal abatement cost. The cost of reducing carbon output is rising quickly. These guys are going to have a hard time with reducing carbon. Does that make sense? Just in terms of these guys, relative to these guys, their cost of reducing carbon is rising more slowly. So if they're both given permits, let's do it like this, right? Uh, this many permits, then, am I doing this backwards? I think I might be doing it backwards. Yes, I am doing it backwards. Sorry, erase, redo. This is why you bring pencils to class. So if you start off here, if you start off with zero reduction of carbon and you want to take one unit of carbon out of the system, you're going to go backwards, right? So this is the cost of reducing one unit and say this is the cost of reducing one unit. That's what I was trying to say. So you have on the, on the left, on the right, you have a company that has to that can reduce carbon by one unit at a fairly low cost. And on the left, you have another company that can reduce carbon at a higher cost. That's just because companies have different technologies, all kinds of reasons, different management, different labor, different products. It doesn't really matter. 
We're only talking about what's the cost of reducing carbon. And if you told both of these companies to cut back their carbon by 50%, you would see that the marginal cost for this company is lower at that 50% cutback than the marginal cost for the other company. If you were only going to do a cap, no trade, then this is what you would have. Okay? We're reducing carbon by 50%. Cap, no trade. From an economic perspective, this is not very efficient because we're not equal on the margin. That's what we want to have. We want to have it equal on the margin. So over here and over here. That's where we are with cap, no trade. Now, if we're going to allow trading, and what that means is we're going to allow one company to reduce by more their carbon, and then they're going to have extra permits to sell for carbon reduction, then the other company is going to not reduce by as much, and they're going to use that permit to emit the pollution. That's the definition of the trade, right? I reduce by more, that means I have, I'm not using all my carbon emission permits, and I can sell you a carbon emission permit, and then you don't have to reduce by as much. What that means is the total carbon is still falling by the targeted amount, by the cap, but the economic cost of reducing that carbon is lower because of the trading. Is that relatively clear? Have you heard this in another class? Yes? Okay, good. Okay, good. So, company A, company B. Which company is going to sell permits? Which company is going to reduce by more, A or B? B is going to reduce by more because they have a lower cost on the margin there. So they're going to say, hey, look, let's meet halfway, right? And this guy will, this guy will put a little bit more carbon out, and this guy will reduce by further on the margin. It doesn't matter if it's the equal number of units because they'll be selling to other companies, right? So the company B, which has a lower cost of reduction, will reduce by more, sell some permits, make some money. Company A and companies like A will buy those permits and uh, not have such a high cost of reducing carbon. Not necessarily. So most cap and trade regimes, this ends up being extremely important. And we have enough time. So what happens is most cap and trade, <coughs> the United States did a, a thing called uh, cap and trade for sulfur dioxide, SO2, back, uh, back in the 1990s. It's, it's an interesting story what happened with sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is another air pollutant, but it's a local pollutant. It's not a greenhouse gas. It would go up in the air, it would rain, and the water would mix with the sulfur dioxide and make sulfuric acid, which is not very good for you, or trees, or your paint job, or whatever on your car. So what the government did is they said, we're having too much pollution. Uh, we're going to put a cap and trade on SO2. But the participants were only power uh, plants, in mostly actually in, the, in the, the, the eastern side of the United States, which is probably the exact same uh, industrial footprint of eastern Canada. And this was uh, extremely successful in terms of reducing sulf sulfur dioxide emissions at a low cost because of the trading. It's, it's actually, among economists, it's considered a very good case study of how to do cap and trade and why cap and trade is a good idea. There's two things that made this a very successful example. Number one, it was uh, limited within one country that could tell everybody what to do. It was mostly limited within one industry, which is power generation. So it was like 200 different traders, not very many traders. Nuclear was not included. Uh, because all they did is they said, everybody who's producing sulfur dioxide in a large scale, you're in. And if you aren't, you're not in, right? So there was no third party, I'll do an offset of my sulfur dioxide by planting trees or anything like that. So the industry, it was within one country. The country could tell them what to do so they could order them around. Number two, it was within one industry and there weren't very many players. Number three, um, it was a fairly easy uh, a way of targeting what was going to happen. So this succeeded wildly, very successful. Now, how is this different from the world and carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases? 
Number one, so this is one country, one industry, and one cap. So in the world with CO2, we've got uh, 200 plus countries, we've got uh, many industries, infinite industries, many, whatever you want to call it, uh, 100 plus industries, and actually there's not even an, an agreement on what the cap should be, right? Because some people, and, and they're not necessarily arguing from the scientific perspective, the oil and gas industry is like, a cap, that could be difficult. You know, we don't want to ruin our lifestyle, do we? Because we always, what is that? Living luxuriously with natural gas is the Fortis motto, right? And I always joke about this with my girlfriend. It's like, why don't you just turn on the hot water and take a walk? You know, go into the kitchen for a little while and let that water run because we're living luxuriously. And we'll open the door, we'll heat it up outside. So anyway, the, the CO2 or the greenhouse gases problem is based on 200 countries and no one could tell everybody else what to do. So they have to agree to play, play, play nice with each other. You've got a bunch of industries that are all saying, give me the permits, give me the permits, give me the permits, right? Because I'm a strategic industry. I make shoes or whatever they're doing, right? Uh, or they're the US, ex-USSR. Or they're saying, well, we should have permits based on population, not based on past output. We talked about that in the last one, right? So there's a huge dis uh, dispute over who's going to get permits and how much. And there's not even an agreement on where the cap should be. Right? Because there's there are some economists, they have a good point. Uh, if we spend a lot of money reducing carbon right now, and that makes us poor, then in the future we won't have as much money uh, and technology to uh, pay for compensation of climate change. Or no, sorry, yeah, we won't have as much money, and we won't be as wealthy to deal with the consequences of climate change. So what we should do is not spend the money now, let it happen, then we'll get rich, and in the future we'll have enough money to take care of the problem. Which is a bit weird, but that's how they discuss it. I personally think it's a terrible idea because the, the cost of reducing carbon is maybe one-tenth, maybe one-one-hundredth of the cost of dealing with the subsequent climate change, right? They're, they're arguing, oh, it's not going to be a big deal. I'm very, very afraid because climate change, remember, is going to arrive uh, through water, right? We put up, we burn the carbon, create the energy, heat up the atmosphere. The hydrologic cycle is what speeds up, right? So you get typhoons hurricanes, droughts, snow, storms uh, uh, that are big, they're small. I mean, it's all, all the weather is going to be really crap. It's going to get worse, basically. And so that's what I'm looking at. And, I'm and we're seeing these multi-billion dollar claims already happening in the insurance industry and people suffering for various reasons. There's droughts and, and so on. And that is stuff that's, if it's not already because of climate change, it's just going to get worse. So anyway, this is why uh, it's hard to do this. And the thing that's important about climate uh, cap and trade is that if you're going to take advantage of this, the bigger the distance between A and B, the bigger the economic efficiency. So they say, it's like, look, in Norway, everything is beautiful. But what we can do is we can, uh, um, we can instead, of, instead of spending a uh, million dollars to reduce carbon by one ton, we can spend a million dollars in India and we'll reduce carbon by 50 tons. So the, the marginal value of money being spent on reducing carbon output is much higher if you're allowed to go across borders. It's the exact same logic as any uh, trade regime. The reason that we, we buy and sell goods across national borders right now is because of this arbitrage. If we could do it with carbon, then it's even better because ultimately the planet is absorbing all of the CO2. We don't care where it comes from, what country. So if we can reduce carbon output in China more cheaply than we can reduce it in Canada, then the Canadians should pay the Chinese to reduce their carbon output. Well, this gets people very upset, right? There's two reasons. One is, why don't they do it anyway? Because it's their obligation. And then they're like, give us money, we'll do it. So there's this huge negotiation called give me your money. And that's still going on between the richer countries and the poorer countries. This is what all the, every time there's a, a breakdown in negotiations and climate change, it's about that, about money. The other one that's crazy is that they have this thing called additionality. Additionality means we're going to pay you to reduce the carbon that you were going to put out anyway unless we paid you. So what that means is the guy with the forest, the, 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 the rainforest, the forests are a big source of, of carbon emissions because when you cut down a tree, the carbon goes up in the atmosphere. Right? Indonesia right now is burning all their trees again for palm oil. Long story. 
and that's putting carbon in the atmosphere. So the guy says, I'm going to chop this tree down, finish the chopping the tree thing. I'm going to chop this tree down unless you pay me not to chop it down. That's what you have, so you have to say, wait, if I didn't pay, if I didn't pay you to chop it down, yes I would. And it's like, okay, I'm not going to pay you, and the guy's like, Tch. and he walks away. So you don't necessarily know if he's going to chop it down or not. And what that means is that someone might say, I'll reduce my carbon if you pay me, but if I'm going to do it anyway, why should I pay you? This ends up being a huge problem, right? And um, we'll get into it more because now we're back on climate change and that'll be more stuff for next week.